I praise the Lord for these high tech guys that we have in the church. I am not high tech. And when I try to be, I, sometimes I feel all thumbs. I, I did uh, put together a, a PowerPoint presentation for a review, and I did that this week, and that's the first time I've ever done that. A little bit of a learning curve, but I figured it out. Some of you might have noticed yesterday I had a, a number of questions for you if you wanted to get to them. And obviously it's, it's on a volunteer basis, but I figured if people are, are able to and have the time, and they want to review, it's a good thing to do. So this morning we're going to be looking at the, the parable of the sower again. We're going to have a quick review, and hopefully time will permit for us to get into the parable of the wheat and the tares. We've all heard of these parables. The parable of the sower, you've heard of that. The parable of the wheat and the tares, I'm sure you've heard of that. So let's turn to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. We're going to begin looking at, the, at verses 10 and 11. Matthew 13, verses 10 and 11. So we're going to, we're going to read through this parable of the sower again, but we've already, already done that last week. But let's look at what happens in verses 10 through 11. So after he gave the parable of the sower, his disciples come to him and it says, And the disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? It is interesting he, that they say them and not us. He answered and said to them, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. What is the mystery? We've already gone through this, so we should, we could, we should be able to go through this quickly. What is a mystery? Okay, but specifically, a mystery is something that was not formally known, okay? Not normally known. I know the mystery you were talking about, the mystery about the church. And there's a, there's a, there are a number of mysteries. Please give me the definition for mystery. Okay, all right. In, in, in context, a mystery here is something that was not formally known. So, regarding the mysteries because he says plural, the mysteries about the kingdom, what was not known before? What was it that was not known? Okay, they didn't know who the Messiah would be. What else was not known specifically about the kingdom? What was not formally known? If Messiah showed up, According to what they thought the Old Testament was teaching, that's right. They would have assumed when the Messiah came, Messiah being present equals the kingdom on earth. And that's not what happened. So what was the mystery that they didn't know that's being revealed in these parables? That there was going to be a, a postponement of the kingdom. Totally brand new information. What was not formally known about the kingdom and the, and the Messiah's first advent at this time was a postponement period. So now that we understand that, there's an important question that we need to ask. When, when did the postponement of the kingdom period begin according to the context of Matthew. See, Joshua was smiling. He must have the answer, so I'm going to ask Josh. When did it begin? During Jesus' ministry, when the message changed from the kingdom of heaven to the kingdom of Okay, all right. So, when the Jews, okay, so we have a number of things happening. First, it's when there's a crystal clear understanding that the nation of Israel, and I want to qualify that, because there were individual Jews that did receive Jesus Christ as Messiah, but nationally they rejected Jesus as Messiah. And the reality is, to this day, exactly what Ruth just said, to this day, 
they still reject the person, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, as their Messiah, even though he is their Messiah. So that's one thing we have to understand. They've rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. So we take that in consideration. And there's also a change in the relationship that Jesus had with Israel nationally. And we see that in the change of the message. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand to the kingdom of heaven has come near you. There's a big difference in that. And there's some other things we're going to look at as well. His, his public ministry, Jesus' public ministry changes. In what way? What are some things that you know of, before we even go forward, that change after Matthew 13 with his public ministry? Can you think of anything? Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you got a chance to look at um, some of the notes and things I put up on, on Facebook, but there's a name that we call that, a period. What kind of period is it? His withdrawal period. His withdrawal period. And if you've never done this, I would encourage you to do this. Read Matthew 13. And then read all the way through until Matthew chapter 21. And write down every time you see where he's going. To the mountains, to the deserts, to a certain city. And whenever you do that, you can either do it on the computer or open up a map in the back of your Bible and track where he goes. And just what Ben said, he is avoiding Jerusalem at all cost until it's the right time. So that's what we call his the withdrawal phase of his ministry. So it's definitely changed quite a bit. We're going to look at this chart here in a second. So I think that this postponement period begins while Jesus' earthly ministry is in its final stages. So that means... I'd ask if you could see over me, but then Josh would laugh. So if it begins before the cross, and I'm not sure if it's a year before, but it's sometime before the cross, that means this postponement period would also include the whole church age that we're in now, and it would also include the 70th week of Daniel. Now when it comes to dispensational thought, there's no question as to the end of the postponement period. Because at the end of the 70th week of Daniel, we know that the Lord is coming back to establish his kingdom. So it's definitely ending there. There's sometimes some, some question as to when it begins, but I believe when we look at all the context, and we'll see it more when we look at the parable of the sower again this morning, that I believe it begins whilst Jesus is still on the earth during his first advent, his earthly ministry. Something that we need to ask ourselves as we go on is who's being addressed in these parables in Matthew 13? Who's being addressed? We look at the context of the Synoptic Gospels, it's dealing with who? What people group? Jews. Jesus makes it clear, I've only been sent to the house of Israel, the lost sheep of Israel. He sends his 12 disciples out to the lost sheep of Israel. He says, don't go to the Gentiles and don't go to the Samaritans. So this is a national message, a national focus that we see. Something else to think about when we want to find out who's being addressed in these parables in Matthew 13, do the disciples, do the disciples have a full knowledge of the church at this point? No. No. If you look at the book of Acts, even at the beginning of Acts, they don't really understand what's going on. There's going to be Jew and Gentile in the same body. We get to Acts chapter 10, we see uh, Peter's vision in Joppa, and all of a sudden God begins to reveal to, to the apostles there's a change going on, something new is going on. And then we have Ephesians chapter 3, the apostle Paul reveals what? The mystery of the church, which is? Someone tell me, what's the mystery regarding the church? Ruth alluded to it earlier. It's the the Jew and the Gentile made one in the church. That's the mystery. 
And another thing regarding who's being addressed in these parables in Matthew 13, the prophecy, and Jesus mentions a number of prophecies during his earthly ministry, but the specific prophecy, and we'll look at it later today, that Jesus mentions here deals with a prophecy about who? It's about Israel. It's about Israel. In fact, let's look there, Matthew 13, beginning in verse 14. And I'll read through verse 15. Now, at the end of his answer to his disciples, in verse 13, he says, Therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. I want you to pay attention to every time we see a mention that they don't understand. And then he goes into verse 14 where he begins to speak about this specific prophecy by Isaiah. And in them, who's the them here? Israel. Israel. And specifically, it's this generation, but I believe it continues on to this day. In them, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you shall hear, and you shall not what? We see it again. No understanding. And seeing you will see and not perceive, for the heart of this people has grown dull, the ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest that they see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand. We see it again. So there's no understanding with their heart, and turn so that I should heal them. Well, that's pretty interesting. The prophecy is a, a, to a specific group, and the prophecy says specifically they will not understand. Does that play a part in the parable of the sower? It certainly does plays an important part because in the context who is the group that doesn't understand according to the prophecy the nation of Israel it's not about the church right and if you're taking notes you might want to write down Acts chapter 28 verses 25 through 28 and here Luke records what Paul says because Paul goes right back to the same prophecy about Isaiah. And he's saying that even at that time, at the end of the book of Acts, in the church age, that the nation of Israel is still in that same phase of what? Blindness. They can't see. And then in Romans chapter 11, it's right here behind me, Paul again reminds us, the blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles is come in. It's still going on today, the blindness. Let's look quickly at the parable of the sower. We've looked at it already last week. The parable of the sower. Let's begin looking at Matthew chapter 13, and I read verses 3 through 8. Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and some came, and, and some birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because there was no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundred and some sixty and some thirty. Notice what he says here. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. I'm not going to get, I don't want to go on a rabbit show, but I just want to say to you that if you have a King James Version, what does it say? Anybody have the King James Version? In verse 9. It says, who, right? Yeah. Who has ears to hear? And the original King James is the only one that made the distinction between who and he has ears to hear. Because only in Matthew 13 is there an article. And I'm not going to get into the distinction in the Greek, but there's got to be a reason why that article is there. And nowhere else in Matthew, when he uses the same phrase, is there an article. That's a discussion for another time in between services if you want to talk to me. But now, 
so we just looked at the beginning, and he's going to explain to them, so that's the parable, he's going to explain to them later what's going on. Let's look at verses 18 through 23, where Jesus explains to them this parable, beginning in verse 18. Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who receives seed by the wayside. But he received the seed in the stony places. This is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Now he received the seed among thorns, and he who hears the word, and the cares of this world, and the seedfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. And now we have the, the, final, the final soil type. But he who receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word. And what's the difference between this soil type and the others? He has understanding and understands it who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. Well, that's interesting. So how many soil types do we have here? Four, okay? How many soil types don't produce fruit? Three. So, if you know your math, there's only one soil type that does produce fruit. And notice something else about this parable. Where does the sower sow seeds? Exactly. On all the soil types. Right? He doesn't say, well, I know this soil type is going to produce fruit, so I'm only going to cast seed there. That's important for us to, to note. He casts it on even the soil types that aren't going to produce fruit. Now, when the disciples ask this question, why do you speak to them in parables? Jesus' answer is this. It has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom, but to them it has not been given. And I want to challenge you to go on, on, a, on, on your own, go through the Gospels, you can even just go through the Gospel of Matthew, and note every time we find information being revealed to some, but not to others, right? When Jesus asked his disciples, whom do men say that I am? So the general populace came up with the wrong answer. He's this, he's that, he's this, but not Jesus Messiah. Then he turns to his disciples and he says, But whom do you say that I am? And Peter says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. What does Jesus say next? Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. Do you see what's going on? To some it was revealed and some it was not. That's what the Bible says. Notice verse 12 of Matthew 13. For whoever has, to him more will be given, and he will have abundance. But note the transition, but whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. How many people are parents here? All right, all right, I want you to be honest with me. Have you ever taken something away from your child? Andy, why? Why do you take it away? It was a form of what? Discipline. What's another word? If you take something away from your child, it's a form of what? Punishment. Could it be a form of judgment for the nation of Israel that even what they have is taken away? I think it very well could be a form of of judgment on a national basis something is taken away it's already clear during Jesus first advent when you look at the nation of Israel that they're being judged what's the evidence of that I'll give you a hint Rome that's right the very fact that Israel at that time was underneath Roman op uh, occupation is an evidence that they were in violation of conditional covenants. Leviticus 26 
and Deuteronomy 28. Because if they were walking right with God, if they were keeping his statutes, if they were obeying his commandments, Rome would not be occupying Israel. But the fact that Israel is being occupied at the time is an evidence of judgment. So this is further judgment that God is taking away even what they have. Let's look at how Isaiah's prophecy plays a part in understanding these parables and what's happening to Israel. Let's look again at Matthew 13, beginning in verse 13. Therefore I speak to them, and I want you to pay attention to how many times we see the word understand in the conscience of, of them not understanding. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not understand, nor do they understand, and in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear, and you shall not understand. And then we jump over to the end of verse 15, lest they should understand with heart and, and turn so that I should heal them. So three times we have this mention of them not understanding. But it's different when Jesus talks to his disciples. Look at verse 16. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For surely I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desire to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Well, that's interesting. How many groups of people do we have here? This is pretty simple. How many groups of people do we have here? We have two. So let's figure out if we can, we can describe them. How would you describe one group? One group, you say, okay. But before we get to that, let's just, just use the words that we found in the prophecy, okay? You're correct, Ben, okay? So there's one group that does not understand. This is in the prophecy. But then Jesus specifically talks to his disciples and says, but you are able to understand. So we have a group that does not understand according to the prophecy, but Jesus is pointing out the fact to his disciples, but you do understand. So we have two groups, a group that understands and a group that does not understand. So what do we see in the parable of the sower? Are there two groups in the parable of the sower? Yes. Are they the same as the prophecy? We, set, we have the majority of them, three soil types that don't understand. And then we have the one good soil type that does have understanding and it produces fruit. That's the difference. Either understanding, either they have understanding or they don't have understanding. So what can we learn from Jesus' explanation about the parable of the sower? There's two things. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom, and what's the word of the kingdom? It would have to include the gospel of the kingdom. It's the word of God about the kingdom. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand this, and just what Ben said, it's, that's equal to not believing that Jesus is Messiah. Because if they rejected the message, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, then they're also rejecting the fact that the king is at hand. Correct? So the two go hand in hand. But then the other part is when Jesus says, but he who received seed in the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. This has to be the group that believes Jesus is Messiah. Now I'm going to ask you a question. Could the unfruitful and fruitful soil types be represented in either Isaiah's prophecy that's predicted about Israel and in what Jesus says to his disciples. I'll say it again. Could the unfruitful and fruitful soil type people be tied into Isaiah's prophecy that's predicted about Israel and also what Jesus says directly to his disciples? Yes. That's the context. It's, it's, the, it's the natural flow it's the little understanding of this context and what's going on. And another question. Could the parable of the sower be depicting 
the ministry of Jesus during his first advent after the postponement period of the kingdom was announced. Is that possible? Mark chapter 4, verse 13, I believe indicates that the parable of the sower is an introductory parable. Note what it says. And he said to them, and by the way, this is, this is a parallel passage to Matthew 13. And he said to them, do you understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? In other words, if they could understand this parable about the sower, then they could understand the other parables. Something also that's interesting about this first parable, the parable of the sower, it is the only parable of all the parables in Matthew 13 that does not begin with, and the kingdom of heaven is like. Is that, is that important to note? Yes, it is important to know. So I love asking questions that we might get to. <laughs> Could it be that the first parable depicts the state of Israel's reception or rejection of Jesus as Messiah before the crucifixion? I think it's very possible. Could it also be that the other parables in Matthew 13 that begin with the kingdom of heaven is like address the postponement period for the kingdom after the cross. We're going to deal with that next week. Now, from the vantage point of the church age saints, and that's us, I believe the first parable depicts what has already happened during Jesus' earthly ministry. The parable of the sower seems to represent the beginning of the postponement period It represents the beginning of the postponement period when Jesus is still on the earth. And I believe the fruit is more likely increased understanding about what? Okay. And also about the Messiah and his kingdom and what's going on. Because everything about the postponement has to do with what? When Jesus is coming back, right? Doesn't Jesus reveal to his disciples as he goes on that he's going to be leaving? Doesn't he? But he also reveals to his disciples that he's what? Coming back. Did they know that in the Old Testament? No. So he, these are part of the mysteries about the kingdom. They all revolve around the Messiah and his kingdom. So, if the fruit is increased understanding, and I believe in the context it probably is, and it also ties in with Isaiah's prophecy about Israel, about some that don't have understanding. The majority of them don't. We could also ask the question, who's the sower? Who's the sower? Probably Jesus, right? Another question we could ask, where is he sowing? Yes, everywhere, Israel. Josh corrected himself. He's right. And who's, who's represented in the soil types? Israel or the church? Context, context, context. I believe in the sower, it's probably Israel in the focus. We're going to deal with the parable of the wheat and the tares uh, more next Sunday, but we have opportunity to just begin to get into it. So let's look at Matthew 13, beginning in verse 24. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in a field, but while he slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted, and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the sower came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. The servants said to him, 
Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. But let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, First gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into the barn. All these parables over the years I have heard uh, a number of times taught incorrectly. And I, I'll just say it, I think it's because there's been so many reformed writers over the years that look at the scriptures totally different than we do that have been some of the more prolific writers and even some churches that are dispensational in nature lean too heavy on reformed writers rather than the word of God and that's what we're going to be, I think, uh, we're accountable for what the Word of God says. The Bible says that we need to rightly divide the Word of Truth. We need to study. It says nothing about commentaries. <laughs> commentaries can be good, but we always need to be like the Bereans that search the Scripture to see whether or not these things are so. Amen? We always have to be like that. Even your study notes. Don't assume that your study notes are always correct. Go to the scripture and be a Berean to see if it is true. So, just like with the parable of the sower, Jesus will explain to his disciples the parable of the wheat and the tares. Let me just say this. There are only two parables in Matthew 13 that Jesus explains. It's the first and the second. And I believe, we're going to see this in a chart in a moment, that the first parable of the sower represents the very beginning of the postponement period. And the second parable with the wheat and tares represents the very ending of the postponement period. So let's look at the explanation that we see beginning in verse 36. And as I'm reading, I want you to have in your mind, because people will go two directions with this. They will either say the parable of the wheat and the tares represents the rapture or they'll say it represents the second coming or there could be a third group, there is a third group, that believes it represents both kind of intertwined. Let's read. So he gives the explanation of the, the uh, parable of the wheat and the tares. And I was going to verse 36. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, the good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil, the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in fire, so will it be at the end of the age. There's two times we've seen that phrase, the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those, that, and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. As I said earlier, Jesus only explains, gives explanation about the first parable of the sower and the second parable about the wheat and the tares. As I've already mentioned, I believe the two parables represent the beginning, the sower, parable, the parable of the sower, represent the beginning of this period, and the parable of the wheat and the tares represents the end of this period. Let's start to figure out, is that actually true? Now, we just read through these parables, and I want you to think about the phrase, the end of the age. Let's start with just Matthew. How does Matthew use that phrase, the end of the age? What is he talking about? Anybody? What is he talking about? Trials 
Take a read there. Look at that verse for a moment. The disciples come to him. This is the, all of the discourse. They ask him a question. Right? What's the phrase? End of the age. When will these things be? And what's the time frame? Does anybody remember? He begins to go through and explain to them the signs and the wonders. And this is a specific phrase that Jesus uses when you see the what? The abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet. What's the time frame? The 70th week of Daniel. Whoa! Does that give us an indicator of the, t the end of the age, the end of the world that Jesus speaks about with the parable of the wheat and the tares? Okay. Something else. In your study of the scripture, do you ever see a time when angels are involved in gathering the saints for the rapture? Hmm. No. Just, I'm just going to just read these quickly. I'm going to go through them quickly. It's pretty clear what's going on here. Every time we see this, when it talks about angels being involved, what's the time frame? The second coming, the end of the seventh week of Daniel, right? So even in context of Matthew, it's pretty clear to see that the first parable of the sower I believe represents the beginning of the postponement period. And the parable of the wheat and the tares represents the end of the period. You can't go to the scripture and find angelic beings being involved in the rapture. But there's also some other things that we should see. Look at Matthew 13, verse 42. And it says, and I will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Huh. Do we find that kind of judgment involved in the rapture? No. In fact, how many, this is a trick question, but I'm going to ask anyway. How many different people groups are involved in the rapture? One. The body of Christ. One group, the body of Christ. And they're all what? Believers in Jesus Christ. But when Jesus comes back at the end of the seventh week of Daniel, he's going to be judging what? Believers and unbelievers. So some of these people, Matthew 13, 42, are going to be cast into the furnace of fire. What do you think that is? Hell. They'll be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Something else to think about in the time frame when Jesus is giving this parable about the wheat and the tares, and the disciples say later that they understand everything that Jesus has said, do the disciples at that time understand the rapture? No. Why do you say that, Josh? Okay. Okay. I would, I would encourage you to go to, you don't have to do this now, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51 to 52. Behold, I what? Show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. The disciples, when Jesus was speaking the parables of the wheat and the tares, they understood the resurrection from the what? The dead but they would not have understand, understood the rapture, which has, in a sense, the resurrection of the dead and the living. Two different things. So, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap it up here, and next week we're going to look again. We're going to review the parable of the wheat and the tares and look at it in a bit more depth. We're going we're gonna to compare another parable in Matthew 13 that I believe covers the same the same issues 
the same time frame. Does anybody know what that might be? The parable of the dragnet. I believe it covers the exact same time period.